when the brightest minds and mightiest lords of mankind convene to discuss the defense of their realms, there always comes a time when the great enemy must be discussed. Arrogant men are reduced to soft whispers in their dealings, praying to their paltry gods that greater powers aren't drawn by such talk. Finally, one amongst them will utter the thing all sane men fear most, the end times. A final age for the entire world, when the tides of damnation will flood out of the north and consume all wholesome life in a titanic battle to decide the fate of everything. Those who understand even a glimmer of the Dark Brothers know that it is not a matter of if, but when the greatest war will begin. Yet hope remains that perhaps it could be staved off for a few more millennia, with some even believing it can be prevented. Surely such a cataclysm would need a trigger to set it in motion. A creature of such immeasurable power and will to bind the fractious legions of chaos into one unstoppable tide. So, they plot and scheme on how to find and destroy this catalyst, searching ancient tomes and the stars themselves to discover its identity. A greater demon, perhaps? With one of the great powers overwhelming all others? Lords who live in the cold north and deep forests suspect it will be the beastmen who spawn such a champion, for they are more dedicated than any to the fall of civilization. Yet those from the southern realms argue it will be the work of mysterious ratmen, creatures far too nefarious and clever for humanity's well-being. Only the wisest seers and priests know the truth. Mankind, no, the world's doom won't be unleashed by some monster born of darkness. It will be man who damns all of creation. One of those known as ever chosen. A champion capable of uniting all the forces of chaos against the many races who would stand against them. Twelve have held this title thus far each of them proving to be nightmarish marks on history, yet they were all struck down by mighty heroes or deadly betrayals. Despite their accomplishments, however, each one of them pales in comparison to the 13th, the one foretold by Necrodomo the Insane to bring about the end times, the one who will shatter nations and burn continents to ash, the one who shall be called Archaon. As one might expect, the origins of Archaon is a tale shrouded in darkness and terror. In the Imperial year of 2390, a terrible storm descended upon the Sea of Claws, bringing with it more than just thunder from the shadows of the north. Norskin marauders sailed down in their longships, eager to plunder and seek glory in the name of their dark gods. Covered by the crashing waves, they launched a surprise assault against the humble fishing village of Hargendorf. The menfolk were still out collecting their catch before it was all swept away by Manon's wrath, leaving those upon the shore vulnerable and unprepared. It was a massacre, the Norskins slaughtering their way across the entire village and gathering plunder. One home struck by the marauders was that of Victoria Rothschild, who huddled with her three children and prayed for Ulrich to spare them. Soon enough, a hulking berserker smashed in her front door, confronting the young woman with bloody axe in hand. Yet she did not scream in terror or flee. Instead, Victoria gathered her courage and approached the Norskin in hopes to bargain for her children's safety. The marauder gruffly accepted this dark deal, dragging Victoria to her bedroom. Her family was spared, but the price was far greater than she realized. The men of Hargendorf returned to their village to find their homes torched and many butchered, the Norskins having fled with their spoils back into the frigid north. Roald Rothschild was relieved to find his family still living, though the obvious price his wife had paid aided him. His resentment only festered as her belly grew with child. A living reminder of that terrible night, which each day leached the life from his love. Yet the Rothschilds tried to endure, 
waiting until the fateful day in which the new child would be born. While childbirth in the Warhammer world is certainly a trying and dangerous affair, the birth of this baby could only be described as unholy. On the ill-fortunate night of the sick, the child of darkness was born. Victoria's final hours of life were spent in intense agony before death finally claimed her immediately following the arrival of her son. Roald was devastated. This monster had just stolen the love of his life from him. He would have killed the child right then if he had perhaps been a crueler man, but he couldn't murder a baby in cold blood. Instead, he told the midwife to take the child, to leave with it and never return. At this point, the woman realized who the boy's father truly was and quietly whisked the child away into the night. Haunted by the sickly light of Morselib, the midwife took the child to the only place she believed he had a chance of a normal life, leaving him at the entrance to a Sigmarite temple. The babe laid out in the moonlight, crying out in loneliness which attracted nearby packs of wolves looking for an easy meal. As they descended upon the child with teeth flashing, a portly man rushed outside of the commotion and smashed into them, wielding a ceremonial censer like a flail. The Sigmarite priest fought like a man possessed, chasing the beasts back into their shadowy forest before scooping up the wailing child. Surprised that someone would abandon a baby on a dark night like this, Hieronymus Dagobert humbly accepted the child into his temple and decided to raise him according to the warrior god's will. Father Dagobert named the child Diederik, a strong and proper name for any true Sigmarite. He raised the boy as his own with fairness and kindness, showing him all of Sigmar's teachings. Diederik loved his adopted father dearly, and worked hard at his chores and readings to please his father. The young man remained at the temple until his early teens, when the priest arranged for him to serve as a squire. Diederik had been deeply inspired by his father's teachings, and worshipped Sigmar with a faith truer and deeper than most devout priests despite being just a child. He leapt at the opportunity to serve under one of the Templars of the Twin-Tailed Orb, a truly revered knightly order. With a kind farewell to Father Dagobert, Diederik leapt with Sir Kastner for the next stage of his life. Sir Kastner proved to be a less than ideal mentor for the young lad, as he was an avid drinker and spent more time drunk than sober. Although he did have moments of bravery against the occasional batch of greenskins or beastmen, the man spent far too much time in his cups to be much of a Templar. Sir Kastner was not a kind man, either. He often took out his anger and frustrations on his squires and beat them frequently. Diederik endured these incidents with great tenacity, his faith in Sigmar providing him with the willpower to resist despair at such treatment. He gathered a solid collection of bruises heading into his teenage years, for Diederik often stood up to Kastner to protect his fellow squire, and each time demanded the knight use a hammer for the beatings, knowing it would tire Kastner out so he wouldn't have the energy to harm others. The boy endured until his destiny would take another step forward. In the year of 2406, Sir Kastner marched out from the town of Suderberg on a drunken quest to find two local children who had gone missing in the Drakwald. When the Templar didn't return the following day, his squire set out to find their missing lord. After many long hours of looking, the two boys found the knight laying at the bottom of a hole he had fallen in, seemingly wounded. It wasn't until Diederik climbed down to reach him that the boy realized both of the knight's legs had been chewed off. He looked around to discover they were surrounded by night goblins, who eagerly waited for the bright moonlight to fade so they could return to their meal. The wretched goblins sprang their trap at that moment, killing the other squire and swarming anywhere the light didn't touch. Diederik acted fast, taking Kastner's revered sword Terminus with a promise to return it to his order as the Templar passed into Moore's realm. Diederik fought his way out and mounted the knight's steed, 
cleaving apart goblins and riding to safety out of the Drakwald. In the aftermath of Sir Kastner's death, Diederik ventured to the Templar's home in the Gruber Marshes, where he met Lady Kastner to tell of her husband's death. When he arrived, he decided to present himself as an illegitimate son of the knight, offering the blade Terminus as proof of both his supposed lineage and Sir Kastner's fate. Diederik was accepted into the family, and took the last name of Kastner for himself, before riding out to Altdorf to present himself to the Templars of the Twin-Tailed Orb. The young man stood before Grand Master Schroeder, leader of the Order, and asked for Sigmar's blessing to join their ranks. Diederik was strong for his age, and possessed a bottomless well of faith in his god, leading the knights to welcome him in. Kastner's supposed progeny would spend the remainder of his teenage years and beyond being trained as a Templar of the Order, learning to be a weapon against the forces of destruction. Diederik Kastner would spend the next 14 years training hard and become one of the greatest Templars his Order had ever seen. By the time he was 30, there was virtually no man who could match Kastner in the art of swordplay or mounted combat. He also proved to be an exceptional scholar, excelling in his studies of Sigmar's teachings, and learning ways to combat the endless enemies of the Empire. During this time in his life, he would proceed to cleave through greenskin tribes, topple beastmen herdstones, and even slay powerful men blessed by the Dark Gods. It seemed to all that he was destined for a truly great future in Sigmar's name, with some even whispering potential to become Grand Master of his order, perhaps something even greater. But Diederik's destiny lay down a far darker and unexpected path, even though it had been foreseen centuries ago. By the time Castor had entered his thirties, there was no man who was more faithful than him in the entire empire. Even the Grand Theogenist Hedrick Lutzenslager would have been incapable of matching the belief and love that Diederik contained in his heart for Sigmar. Every day he wandered the dark forests and mountain passes, protecting innocence from unimaginable horrors. Then came the fateful event that would lead his world to ruin. A truth so foul it would burn to his core and leave him changed forever. A desperate courier brought to the Knight's Temple a heretical tome titled the Liber Caliestor. Unknowing of the terrors contained within, like many such tomes of evil, the greatest of Sigmar's knights sat to examine the tome deep within the vaults underneath the temple. It was crucial for the faithful to study the works of the enemy. It was one of the only ways to glean information on the great enemy, and perhaps one day may even provide an answer on how to defeat the Dark Brothers, once and for all. Kastner made his prayers to Sigmar and opened the horrid book, burying himself in the dark prophecy told within. To his mounting horror, the Templar realized that the Liber Caliestor spoke of the greatly feared end times, and how they would be brought about. It spoke of six powerful artifacts that would need to be claimed by one who would seek the mantle of Everchosen, and bring about the destruction of all things. Yet it continued, laying out the life story of the man who Necrodomo saw as destined to become this Lord of Chaos. Diederik could not look away from the flesh-bound pages, scanning each line in a frenzy as the cold chill of terror settled on his spine, for he read a story all too familiar to him. This ever-chosen's life, it was his life. Everything he had done, everything he had believed, was laid bare like some twisted play, and the book led to only one obvious conclusion. He was this ever-chosen, this Archaon. Darkness filled the chamber, and thunder rumbled outside as the hammer blow of this revelation fell upon Kastner. It could not be. This heresy must be false. 
He hurled the book across the chamber and turned to a shrine of his god, pleading with it to show him a sign that this was false. Yet as he tried to say Sigmar's name, the Templar found he could not. Lightning flashed from the windows upstairs as Diederich stood before the cold and unfeeling statue before him. He was empty. He could feel, somehow, deep down, Sigmar's light no longer rested in his breast. Enraged, he screamed at the idol before him. After everything I've done for you, I have lived a devout existence, bettered myself with study for your good grace, trained to my limits and served you through the sword. I have honored you. I have loved you. I have given you everything I have. Yet you left me on a path to I know not where. A cold silence met the kneeling man, his pleas fading away into hisses of frustration. Stiff with emotion and disbelief, the Templar picked up the damned book and sat once more, determined to finish it. Within he learned of his destiny, but most importantly the book's revelations on the gods of men themselves. Sigmar was a lie. Ulrich was a lie. All of them. Cruel deities who cared not for the greatness of men, but instead their own petty games. Fate claimed that this Archaeon would rise to destroy the world, ending the age of both gods and men forever. No more manipulation. No more twisted fates. No more gods. Good, he whispered, the darkness swelling around him in anticipation. Suddenly crying out in rage and agony, the Templar turned and smashed the idol to pieces with his blade. No longer would he be a puppet in the games of the gods. He would end this disgusting world setting all of creation free from the threads of fate once and for all. His sword slashed out time and again, collapsing piles of books and scripts until the entire vault looked the part of ruin. With a cold smirk, he knocked over a candle onto the clutter and watched it set ablaze. As he slowly walked out of the temple, the flames consumed everything as if possessed by some demonic intent consuming all evidence of Diederich Kastner. It was fitting, the Templar thought, for that name to die here as well. That name belonged to a Sigmarite, a foolish man who had given his soul to a cruel god and a weak nation. Kastner was dead, and Archaon was born. Bearing the name fate had given him, Archaon recalled that the Liber Caliestor told that the first trial of the Everchosen would be to march into the realm of Chaos itself. So did the former Templar cut a bloody path through the Empire, killing any man who dared cross his path. Every step he took towards the north seemed only to provide the knight with more strength. He could feel power surging in his body, and his endurance grew beyond that of a mortal man. It was as if rejecting the false gods of the Empire opened him up to receiving true strength. The journey did prove perilous, as his path wandered into the dark forests of the north, mutants and beastmen seeming to plague his steps at every turn. Yet even this myriad of creatures stood no chance, each being butchered by Archaon and leaving a trail of corpses in his wake. Eventually, he reached the wild lands of Troll Country, slaying hungry monsters and roving groups of trolls. Finally, he crossed through the frigid Northlands, pushing past the Shadowlands full of unspeakable horrors and arriving at the threshold to the realm of chaos. To cross into that land was to leave reality and sanity behind, to enter a world full of demons and abominations all dictated by the will of hateful gods. Archaon didn't even break his stride, his willpower far too great for fear of the unknown to make him even hesitate. The realm of chaos is nearly impossible to describe, a place of ceaseless change 
where all things are constant and the laws of nature don't apply. The land constantly shifts from towering mountains of brass to valleys full of sludge in an instant. Howling storms of laughing skulls morph into acid rain. Screams of pleasure and madness haunt the very winds, and a man can travel 1,000 miles in a step or two feet in a year. Worse still are the inhabitants of these lands. Endless hordes of mortals seeking glory in the name of their gods, mutated monsters that are no longer identifiable, roving in search of flesh, and tides of demons slaughtering one another as part of some cosmic game. Archaon merely took it all in stride, his desire for vengeance against the world anchoring his sanity in a place lacking any. The Dark Knight simply continued forging his way through the flowing landscape, with certainty that the Dark Gods see his path true, for he would be ever chosen. How long Archaon remained in the realm of chaos is it known, for it is indeed impossible to know. By the true world standards, he spent less than a year in the Dark God's playground, and covered unlikely distances as well. Yet from his perspective, the knight wandered for what seemed like decades, though he only grew more powerful as he aged. Many warriors and creatures of chaos confronted the knight, whether seeking personal glory or flesh to eat, but all fell before his blade. Some proved to be worthy, however, and Archaon spared them so that they might join him. The most powerful of these were a group of chosen known as the Swords of Chaos, each of them a horrifically skilled warrior, well blessed already by the Chaos Gods. Together they formed an elite bodyguard, who were fiercely loyal to their lord. In addition to Norskins and Warriors of Chaos, various champions and sorcerers pledged their allegiance to the Dark Knight. Even the likes of Beastmen joined his ranks, lured by the promise of flesh to feed on after glorious battles. Finally came the largest beasts, from ravenous chaos ogres to horrific mutilith vortex beasts. All who crossed Archaon would either swear allegiance to him, or die. With an army at his back, the Chaos Lord's step suddenly led him out of the realm of chaos and onto the frozen lands north of Nagaroth. Clearly, the gods had decided it was time for Archaon to be tested, and make his attempt at recovering the first artifact of the Everchosen. His march toward the land of the Dark Elves was relentless, with more roving bands of marauders joining his horde as he approached the target, the Altar of Ultimate Darkness. A powerful relic of Chaos Undivided, the altar had been stolen ages ago by the Drukai, and hidden deep within the Citadel of Spite. Approaching the tower unnoticed was practically impossible, as the sorceresses of Morathi were always using their dark magics to scout the northern border. When Archaon approached the tower, he found a massive dark elf army as expected, but was quite surprised to see his was not the only Legion of Chaos seeking to claim this prize of the gods. Already engaged with the children of Nagaroth was the Bloodsworn, a corn worshipping legion led by Goroth the Ravager. Known as probably the most powerful mortal champion of the Blood God, Goroth had been sent by his own lord to set up a twisted contest between the two Chaos Lords. The Bloodsworn had been easily tricked into an ambush, where they were pinned and being sighed down by Reaper Bolt Thrower Fire. Archaon quickly summarized that unless the two forces of Chaos fought together, the Drukai would easily be able to slay them all. Roaring for his forces to charge, the Dark Knight led his Swords of Chaos down the snow-covered cliffline and into the Dark Elves. Warhounds sped after Dark Riders who had been harassing Korn's followers, their snapping jaws dragging down horse and rider alike. Shades who had thought themselves safe in the surrounding forests were impaled with javelins thrown by marauder horsemen. Freed up at last, the Bloodsworn charged forward, even as the sky was filled with black-fletched crossbow bolts that slewed roves of marauders. The more heavily armored warriors simply continued advancing, 
uniting with Archeon's host and simply crushing those that had fallen under their iron boots as they closed in on the Drukai. Realizing that the Warriors of Chaos weren't halting, the Dark Shards quickly retreated to safety as a line of Dread Spears moved to the front, raising their weapons to form a jagged wall of razors. The first lines of the Chaos Horde died in agony as they were impaled by the Spear Wall and inviscerated by lightning-fast strikes of the Elves. But Archeon and Garroth urged their followers on. Now within reach, the Dark Elves were butchered as the Chaos Warriors cleaved through flesh and armor with ease. The heaviest fighting centered around Archeon and the Swords of Chaos, who battled in the shadow of a great war shrine, and they fought all the harder knowing that the Dark Gods were watching. As Archeon cut down another Dark Elf, he heard a great roar from above that announced the arrival of the Drukai's general. Soaring down from the dark clouds above came a black dragon, spewing noxious gas that left entire regiments as steaming piles of flesh. Atop the beast rode a beauteous sorceress, who unleashed swaths of dark magic on the warriors below. Enraged at this cowardly display of magic, Goroth roared a challenge up at the elf mage, knowing if he slew her great beast that surely the gods would grant him even further favor. Amused by his rage, the sorceress responded with mocking laughter, before calling down a howling whirlwind of blades that enveloped the Chaos Lord, flensing the flesh from his bones in an instant. Archeon could only glare in rage at the dragon as it soared above the battlefield, bolts of magic crashing down again and again. Inspired by their mistress, the Drukai rallied and pressed back the Warriors of Chaos. One elf approached Archeon, his eyes gleaming with murderous intent as the Dark Elf cast off his cloak. Now revealed, the assassin leapt towards Archeon, who only just managed to parry aside the Drukai's attack. The parry tore the Chaos Lord's sword out of his grip, but that did not mean he was defenseless. As the assassin launched for the killing blow, Archeon dropped his shield and with alarming speed grabbed the elf's wrist while his other hand gripped the would-be killer's throat. Easily much stronger than his opponent, Archeon raised the Drukai in the air and proceeded to cut out the assassin's heart with his own dagger. Raising the bloody heart to the Chaos War Shrine, Archeon felt the gaze of the Dark Brothers upon him. The gory heart in his hand began to beat once more, and a bolt of red lightning split the skies asunder. Korn's rage had already been tempted with the loss of one of his champions to cowardly magic, and now a worthy offering had been made to earn his wrath. And Korn had answered. Descending from the heavens upon wings of fire came Valkia the Bloody. She howled an unearthly cry as she dived straight towards the black dragon. All eyes turned up to witness the titanic clash as Korn's vengeance speared through the air, decapitating the Supreme Sorceress before the elf had time to utter a single spell. With the loss of its mistress, the dragon went berserk, slashing claws at the speeding Gore Queen and trying to snap her up in its massive jaws, but to no avail. Valkia landed blow after blow on the beast, tearing open its flesh and raining blood on the battlefield below. Gaining strength with each wound she inflicted, Valkia launched towards the dragon's head and with one final slash cut open its throat, casting its lifeless body down to the earth. With a victorious shriek, the Gore Queen descended into the battle below. With Valkia among them, the Bloodsworn redoubled their efforts knowing that Korn's consort could see their efforts. Sensing the enemy was wavering, Archaon charged headlong into the enemy at the head of the Swords of Chaos and butchered all in their path. Like a hammer blow, the Warriors of Chaos smashed aside the Dark Elves' defenses in a frenzy of tentacles, claws, and blade. The Drukai were routed. Knowing that Korn's legions couldn't resist the urge to pursue and butcher every last elf, Archaon approached the Citadel of Spite and entered to claim his prize. Within the spire was pure darkness, as if light feared to approach the unholy artifact contained within. 
Entering alone, the Dark Templar placed trust in his instincts, slowly making his way through labyrinth tunnels flooded with primordial blackness. Most men would have been terrified of such a place, haunted by what horrors might lurk in the unknown, with no sense of sight to aid them. But to one who had walked through the realm of chaos, this trial hardly concerned him. Archaon descended deeper and deeper into the citadel, until he arrived at an ancient metal door that was visible due to a pulsing dark light. This had to be what he sought. Archaon could feel the evil radiating from within. Eager to fulfill the first part of his destiny, the knight smashed through the age-weakened door with ease. Within, he heard signs of movement surrounding him. As Archaon leveled his sword towards the source, the tunnel suddenly erupted with the screams of countless creatures. These wretched beings had once been slaves of the Dark Elves, before being drawn to the altar's power, getting lost in the endless dark before being mutated into troglodytes. With withered limbs and sharpened teeth, the mindless creatures descended upon the Chaos Lord in a massive swarm. Archaon roared his defiance, cutting through entire groups with each swing of his weapon. Although individually weak, there were so many of the horrific creatures that it was like fighting a single monster that had infinite arms and mouths. Even with all his great skill, Archaon could only kill so many at a time, and the grasping creatures managed to tear his armor apart piece by piece. Dozens lay dead, but more came still, broken bodies flying in all directions. A group of arms managed to wrap around Archaon's shield, tearing it from his arm, but still he kept on, gripping his blade with both hands and swinging with wild abandon. The room was quickly coated in gore as the death toll reached hundreds slain, before Archaon's blade became lodged in the bones of another troglodyte and fell from his grasp. Unarmed and with only torn rags defending him, the Dark Templar's rage reached its peak and he swung his fists with unrestrained might. He would not die here. He would not fail his quest to become Everchosen before it had even begun. Just as suddenly as the battle had started, it ended. Breathing heavily from his efforts, Archaon searched the room with only his sense of touch to guide him through the carnage. It only took him a few steps to discover the first pillar, which upon exploring he felt the symbol of Slanesh carved into it. Stumbling a while further, Archaon discovered yet another pillar, but this time carved with an icon to Nurgle. Realization dawned as he began to move with purpose, discovering two more pillars equal distances apart belonging to Zinch and Korn respectively. The four great pillars marked with the greatest of the ruinous powers. Snarling with triumph, Archaon was certain he had found it. The Altar of Ultimate Darkness. He now understood the name. For the altar was impossible to see, for none were worthy to ever gaze upon its magnificence. The pillars each stood at the far corners of what he suspected to be the Star of Ruination, but there were more pillars further out. Here were marked the many lesser powers of Chaos, those closest to the four undoubtedly wielding more power. Demon princes, Chaos beings masquerading as gods, and other dark powers were here. Eager to claim his prize, Archaon marched into the center of the altar and demanded the gods give him what was owed. In response, powerful bolts of dark energy struck Archaon from all sides. The Chaos Lord screamed as power surged through him, reknitting his wounds even as it burned his very soul. Energy crackled across his flesh as all of his hair was burned away and his very being was pulled from all angles, as if the gods sought to tear him apart. But Archaon would not yield, his soul anchored to his unbreakable will. Abruptly, the beam ceased, the Chaos Lord collapsing to his knees as his flesh steamed. He could feel that he was changed, a dark and terrible power burning in his core. Upon his bald head had been seared the Star of Ruination, the eight-pointed sign of Chaos Undivided. These black marks would forever smolder with the Dark God's favor, and clearly crowned him for greatness. 
Archeon stood slowly and wandered back out into the tunnels. Nothing challenged his exit, for no creature within the Citadel of Spite still drew breath. Emerging once more into the frigid air, Archeon found the remaining warriors of Chaos awaiting his return outside. Reverent gasps filled the air as all present saw the mark upon the Dark Templar's brow, each man quickly kneeling. With Goroth slain, even the Gorsworn bent the knee and pledged service to their new lord. Archeon's horde had now easily doubled in strength. Of Valkia, there was no sign. Likely, the Gore Queen had been summoned away to another battlefield. After his victory at the Citadel of Spite, Archeon led his massive horde to the nearest Dark Elf port and quickly butchered the defenders stationed there. The warriors of Chaos looted the area for supplies before loading aboard one of the Drukai's massive metal ships. Sailing out on their stolen vessel, Archeon's legions made for the Great Ocean, and the search for the second artifact of Chaos began. For many years they sailed the seas, attacking numerous islands and civilizations to gain further glory in the name of the gods. Yet still, Archeon could not find any clues as to the location of the next relic he required to become Everchosen. Becoming increasingly frustrated, the Chaos Lord ventured further than any who had sailed before into undiscovered lands. After wandering for months on end without stopping, he finally arrived on a land no man had ever walked. Embarking out at the head of his horde, Archeon discovered an ancient city overrun with savage half-humans that defended their sacred lands. For six days and six nights the warriors of Chaos fought, until at long last their foe had been exterminated and their city cast into ruin. In the aftermath of the battle, Archeon explored the depths of a great necropolis that formed the center of the ancient city. After descending for some time into the abyss, the Chaos Lord found a large chamber with an isle of black rock sitting in the center of pooling lava. Lining the walls were countless sarcophagi bearing the ruinous star of Chaos United. Filling with anticipation, Archeon swiftly marched across a series of small volcanic rocks that granted access to the center. Clearly, this was some tomb for those favored by the Dark Gods, and whomever rested at its heart must be a true champion indeed. Approaching the center through noxious gases and searing heat, Archeon found a stone dais upon which stood an imposing suit of armor. Breath escaped the Dark Templar as he fell to his knees in reverence at this sight. There was no doubt in his mind that this must be yet another one of the artifacts of chaos. Upon approaching the suit of armor, Archeon noticed that a small bronze plate was embedded upon the stone dais. Etched in dark tongue was two words, the first reading unconquered, and beneath it the name Morkar. This gave the Dark Knight pause, for he now realized exactly whose tomb he stood in. Morkar the Uniter, first ever chosen of Chaos. Without a doubt one of the most terrifying figures who had ever roamed the earth, he had never lost a battle until his death at the hands of Sigmar Heldenhammer. How his legendary armor had come to rest in this place was a mystery, but Archeon would have his prize. As he reached out towards it, however, the armor suddenly lurched into motion and smashed a gauntlet into the knight's face. Roaring with pain and surprise, Archeon was launched from his feet and crashed to the ground. In a moment, the suit was upon him, swinging with the might of a giant. The aspiring champion rolled away and tried to defend himself but found his opponent was both stronger and faster. Each blow knocked Archeon closer to the molten lake surrounding them, and realization dawned that if he didn't end this quickly, he would most certainly die here. Accepting that there was no time to draw his blade as another fist whipped past his head, Archeon's mind raced with a way to claim victory against a warrior who could only be slain by a false god. The answer came suddenly as the Dark Templar found himself trapped on the slate shore, the intense heat singeing his flesh. Reaching back to memories of when he was a devout Sigmarite, 
Archaon roared a curse in the unburrogan tongue. Sigmar's tongue. Brindan utva loit! Burn by the light. The words seemed to slam into Morkar's armor, stunning the metal colossus for just a moment. That was all Archaon needed, and he placed all his might behind a single attack, smashing the armor apart. The spirit of Morkar was banished, and Archaon claimed the second artifact of the Everchosen. He waded through the lava as if it were only warm water, returning triumphant to his legions above. When Archaon had been strapping the armor of Morkar onto his frame, he noted that there was a small indent in the helm's forehead that was clearly intended to be filled by something. Consulting with the Zinchian sorcerers pledged to his cause, the Chaos Lord learned that the missing piece was the third artifact he must seek, known as the Eye of Shirian, a terribly powerful gem that appeared to be an all-seeing third eye. The item was said to have provided the demon sorcerer Shirian with unfathomable power. Surprisingly, the resting place of the item was well known, rather the issue laid with the creature guarding it. The Yin Ye Long, an ancient beast recorded in history as the Great Terror of Cathay. There had been a time when the Celestial Chaos Dragon visited its wrath upon the great nation of the East, devastating the Orient for over a thousand years. Known as Flame Fang in the West, the beast's most notable feature was its three heads that spewed forth the changing flames of Zinch. None had ever survived being touched by this flame, and Flame Fang had reduced entire armies to gibbering piles of mutated flesh in a single pass. If Archaon wanted to become Everchosen, he would have to venture to the Cliff of Beasts in the Chaos Wastes and confront the Flesh Storm. Another few years passed at sea as Archaon returned to the Northlands, seeking out his monstrous foe. Setting his feet back on familiar shores, the Dark Templar made haste with the Swords of Chaos at his back to confront the ancient beast. It was easy enough to locate the Cliff of Beasts, as the base of its massive structure is dominated by the bones of massive creatures. Archaon left his guard behind and entered the cave of Flamefang, announcing his presence by smashing his axe into one of the dragon's foreheads. Enraged, the monster awoke and picked up Archaon with its massive claws before emerging out of the cave in a whirlwind caused from its mighty wings. Hurling the Chaos Warrior to the earth, Flamefang unleashed a torrent of multicolor flame that sent the very earth into a volatile explosion of writhing change. Yet Archaon charged through the smoke unharmed, his armor protecting him from the flesh storm. He struck the beast again and again, tearing away scales with each crushing blow on the monster's hide. Flamefang roared in challenge and the two fought for hours, crashing through the skeletons of forgotten titans in their struggle. Although the armor of Morkar proved inviolable to the dragon's attacks, Archaon was displeased to discover that he also was making little headway in killing the beast. Flamefang was frustrated by this worthy foe, for no warrior had ever been able to simply shrug off the flames of change. Even worse, the impudent human was unnaturally swift and mighty, thus he could parry aside or dodge earth's shattering blows. At this rate, the two were trapped in a stalemate, but Flamefang would suffer no man to be its equal. Lashing out with its serpentine body, the dragon struck the earth with such force that even Archaon stumbled just long enough for Flamefang's jaws to snap down. The fallen Templar barely had time to raise his shield before being outright devoured by the dragon, tumbling down its huge gullet into a dark stomach full of acid below. Outraged at his current situation, Archaon stood up and roared in anger before swinging his axe like a madman at the dragon's insides. Perhaps the Chaos Dragon had hoped that its stomach acid would overcome the enchantments of Archaon's armor, but the demon-forged plate would not yield even to this. The Chaos Lord's attacks tore through the soft organs of Flamefang with ease, the dragon crying out in agony as it writhed upon the ground. After several minutes, the beast's insides were shredded, and it shuddered before giving in to death. Victorious, 
Archaon carved his way out of the dragon's body and plucked the eye of Shirian from its gem-encrusted belly. The talisman hung around his neck as a trophy. The third artifact of the Everchosen had been claimed. Gathering up the Swords of Chaos and riding out to reunite with his army, the Lord of Chaos found himself once more in a position of not exactly knowing where his next task was. So Archaon set out north once more towards the Realm of Chaos, seeking answers to continue his quest. For over a decade, the aspiring Everchosen searched for answers as to the location of the fourth treasure. His efforts proved fruitless until one day crossing paths with a demon that sought to slay him. Engaging the winged brute in battle, Archaon proved to be far deadlier than his opponent anticipated and quickly subdued the beast. Worse still for the demon was that as Archaon gazed through the eye of Shirian, he realized the creature's true nature. Stepping back and demanding that it show its actual form, the demon's body contorted and shifted, until a smaller robe-covered figure with multiple arms remained. Archaon grunted in recognition at the Changeling, one of Zinch's most prized servants and an infamous trickster. The warlord set about threatening the demon. To leave his questions unanswered would result in the end of all the creature's treasured games. The cackling abomination agreed well enough informing him that the treasure he sought could be found in the menagerie of the demon lord, Agramon. Setting out at once, the army of Archaon rapidly approached the demon palace to find it guarded by a massive legion of monsters and demonettes. The collection-obsessed keeper of secrets, Agramon, was clearly favored by Slanesh for his excessive habits, and the greater demon would not allow thievery. Unconcerned by the demonic legions swarming before him, Archaon simply ordered his army to charge and commit to a full assault upon the demons of Slanesh. As the masses surged past him, the Chaos Lord quickly led the Swords of Chaos away from the main battle and towards Agramon's menagerie. Scything through waves of demonettes that attempted to block his path, Archaon forced his way into the maze of cages that surrounded the Demon Lord's palace. Ordering his guard to defend their breach, the Lord of Chaos quickly began searching for his goal. Using the Eye of Shirian's power, Archaon quickly scanned the zoo until a particular cage caught his attention. Within the Enchanted Iron was a creature made entirely of black smoke and raging flames that radiated an aura of endless hatred. Archaon approached it and found two scorching eyes of hellfire meet his gaze that fostered a dark intellect. Grabbing a spiked demon-made harness hanging from a nearby post, the Dark Knight entered the cage and stoically marched up to the beast. There was no longer any doubt in his mind. This had to be Dorgar, steed of the apocalypse and fourth artifact of the Everchosen. Upon getting close, Dorgar shifted into the form of a massive black stallion with bone spikes protruding from his shoulders and bearing fangs that promised an agonizing death. Unfazed, the aspiring Everchosen tossed the saddle onto the demonic steed, and all hell suddenly broke loose. Dorgar changed its form within a second, charging Archaon with a head of spiked antlers that hurled him into unyielding bars. He had hardly hit the ground before the beast slammed into him again, but this time with a hammerhead of some seaborne monster. The armor of Morkar protected Archaon from broken bones, but his body ached with pain from each colossal hit that the demon delivered. As it came with another charge, this time he dodged, shouldering the beast in a counterattack that slammed it against the walls. With it momentarily stunned, Archaon brutally forced the rest of the riding equipment onto Dorgar and secured its bindings. He barely managed to pull up in the saddle when the demon steed recovered and charged out of its cage. Archaon could do little but hold on, as Dorgar shapeshifted time and again in its efforts to buck him off. The beast would slam hard into other cages in attempts to shatter his legs, but still the man held on. Spying a host of demonettes moving in to protect their lord's prized possessions, Dorgar shifted into a horrific imitation of a rhinox and plowed into their lines. Archaon swung his blade wildly as he tried to parry the flurry of strikes from the lesser demons, which of course his mount was purposefully opening him up to. 
He managed to strike the beast's flanks a few times before it shifted yet again, this time becoming a limber great cat that started ascending the palace. Despite the constant jolts and pull of gravity, Archaon still refused to let go, and pulled hard on the reins in an attempt to control the raging creature. This only aggravated it worse, and Dorgar launched from the crystal spires, shifting now into a horrendous bat-like monster with wings. Soaring across the skies, it bucked and spun in hopes of dislodging the Chaos Warrior, but still he held. Growing desperate, the creature abandoned bestial forms and turned into a roaring comet of flame that streaked across the sky. Had it not been for his armor, Archaon surely would have been incinerated in that moment. Still clutching the reins and roaring his defiance, suddenly the world flashed white and the Chaos Lord found himself lying in a crater. The shape-changing demon had played its greatest hand by turning into a bolt of eldritch lightning and slammed them both into the earth. Although this had successfully dismounted its rider, Dorgar could hardly stand from the blow it had suffered. Archaon had had enough. Charging the demonic steed, the Lord of Chaos brought his blade to its throat and demanded that it yield to him or be slain. After a long pause, the demonic steed spoke in an unknowable tongue and stood slowly before bowing its equine head. Dorgar accepted its new master, and with that Archaon now had the fourth treasure of Chaos. The Chaos Warrior mounted his demonic steed and rode back to Agramon's palace to relieve the Swords of Chaos. As almost a gesture of good faith, Archaon proceeded to free all of the monsters contained within the menagerie and allowed them to rampage. Though a powerful keeper of secrets, even Agramon could not stand against his collection of creatures and was crushed to oblivion beneath their wrath. With those that could be salvaged as beasts of burden or war, the aspiring Everchosen set out once more. Returning to the mortal plane at long last, Archaon already had heard legends about where the next artifact resided. In the Chaos Waste, there was a place called the Chimera Plateau, where a demon sword named the Slayer of Kings was said to rest. Leading the rather tattered remains of his army after their battle against Agramon's demons, the Warriors of Chaos made swift progress to their destination. At the base of the plateau, Archaon found hordes of Chaos Champions all battling for the right to claim the sword as their own. Ordering his troops to stand down, the Lord of Chaos rode onward and faced any who would dare challenge him. Even after hundreds of duels against the mightiest of combatants, he stood undefeated. Archaon spared all who would swear loyalty to him, and casually butchered the rest. By the time he reached the higher reaches of the plateau, his army had swollen once more to such size that the Chimera guarding the passes were quickly overwhelmed. Beyond this point, the terrain proved incredibly treacherous, and so Archaon only took with him his three most trusted companions. Ascending the Lonely Mountain, the group was surprised to find that the slope seemed to have once been some great battlefield. Countless blades, arrows, and other weapons of war were embedded in the earth like some odd display of ancient weaponry. Still, they pressed on towards the summit in search of the demon blade, when suddenly a great earthquake struck. Lowering themselves to the ground so as not to plummet to an early death, the Chaos Warriors watched in disbelief as part of the mountain itself moved. As great collections of dust shifted and cliffs of stone collapsed, massive scales the color of midnight black were revealed. Even Archaon was stunned at the dawning realization that this was no mountain, but some impossibly colossal monster. Close as he was to the top, the Chaos Lord could see the Titan's face, and recognized that it bared a striking resemblance to the creatures of Chaos known as Dragon Ogres. Guessing by the color of its scales and godlike stature, there was no doubt that this must be Krakenrock the Black, father of the Dragon Ogre race. This was not a task that could be accomplished through battle, for even Archaon's entire army were but a collection of ants to this brute. 
a stealthier approach would be required, and so the party pressed on with careful steps. After reaching Kraken Rock's head, Archeon spied a blade lodged in the Titan's flesh that carried such an aura of dread that it could only be the Slayer of Kings. Unfortunately, the blade was held in place by one of the Titan's massive talons, which would take an incredible feat to even moderately shift. As chance would have it, one of Archeon's three companions was Prince Ograx the Great, a towering chosen of corded muscle who was well imbued with Korn's endless rage. Grunting with effort, the strongest of Archeon's warriors managed to lift the Talon just high enough for the Lord of Chaos to grip the Slayer of Kings. The moment the blade came free, however, the demon contained within unleashed an unearthly shriek that threatened to awaken the sleeping Titan. Thinking quickly, Archeon raised the sword above his head in both hands and plunged it into Prince Ograx's straining form. As he suspected, the Slayer of Kings suddenly went silent as it gorged on royal blood. With the weapon still sheathed in the Chosen's corpse, Archeon ordered his two remaining companions to carry Ograx down back onto the plateau. The aspiring Ever Chosen finally tore the Slayer of Kings free once they had descended off Kraken Rock's sleeping form, holding the fifth treasure of chaos high above his head to the cheers of his followers. Only one final artifact stood between Archeon and his destiny, a fabled relic known as the Crown of Domination. Long ago during the time of Morkar, it had held the Eye of Shirian and then been fused within the helm of the first Ever Chosen. Without the crown, Archeon could never claim his rightful place as the Ender of Nations, so the search was on. For over 60 years, the Dark Templar roamed the earth at the head of his unholy host, searching for any clue as to the crown's whereabouts. Despite interrogating ancient demons, plundering forgotten realms, and striking bargains with powerful wizards, there wasn't so much as a hint to its location. After Archeon's warships left a fruitless search of the Isle of Corpses, they were enveloped in a mighty tempest that blew the fleet towards the distant shores of Bretonia. Awaiting them was the misshapen form of Village the Cursling, one of Zinch's mightiest mortal sorcerers. The Twisted Twin had heard of the Chaos Lord's quest, and would tell him the crown's resting place in exchange for a favor. The Zinchian required a small trinket contained within Brilloin Castle, and needed Archaon's legion to defeat the Bretonians. Although he suspected a trap, the Dark Templar was desperate for answers, and so ordered his army to war. We'll cover the Siege of Brilloin in the famous battle section later on. After the battle, Archaon surveyed the massacre with approval before his nearest bodyguard was suddenly crushed by a thunderous blow from a slaughter brute. Snapping his attention to the monster's handler, the Everchosen saw that Village had killed the man, thus causing the beast to rampage. The Swords of Chaos were a collection of the greatest warriors found in the world, but the knights were no match for the explosive might and speed of this nightmare. The Slaughter Brute crushed riders and steeds both, bony spikes slicing through Hellforged armor with ease. As the monster loomed over Archaon, he unleashed the greater demon bound within the Slayer of Kings. As the power of Uzul coursed through him, the Lord of Chaos moved forward in a blur and stabbed towards the hulking creature. The demon sword plunged into the Slaughter Brute's heart, killing the beast instantly in an impossible display of strength. Enraged at this expected betrayal, Archaon dismounted and marched towards the Cursling, scattering the Twisted Twin's bodyguards like ragdolls. Flattening the sorcerer with an earth-shattering punch, the Dark Templar rested the Slayer of Kings on his foe's throat and demanded to know the Crown of Domination's location. Cackling to himself, Village uttered the name Bellicor, before vanishing into a puff of multi-hued smoke. Swearing a reckoning the next time they met, Archaon gathered his legions and set out once more for the north. It appeared that only the first Demon Prince knew the crown's location. Arriving in the Chaos Wastes, 
Archaon performed a ritual to summon the mightiest of all demon princes. Upon the demon's appearance, the Dark Templar demanded to know the location of this final trial. Bellicor hated this man, for he was jealous at missing the glory that should rightfully be his. However, the gods compelled him to speak the truth. He revealed that the crown's location was in the first shrine to Chaos, where the first human had bartered his soul away to the Dark Gods in exchange for power and immortality. This most unholy chamber could be found high in the Northern World's Edge Mountains. Setting out immediately to the south, Archaon left his horde to fight the dwarves and ogres below, while he marched alone to the hidden alcove. As the Lord of Chaos approached the ancient gateway, blasphemous runes ignited along its arch and the doors groaned open. Without so much as a glance behind him, Archaon entered the mountain and found a dark labyrinth awaiting him. Dire beasts and vengeful demons stalked the halls, but all fell before the knight's wrath. Beyond this myriad of forgotten foes, lied a series of trials that had each been crafted by one of the Dark Gods. For the first part of his final trial, Archaon entered a fetid hall in which sat a massive mound of bodies. All around him came the sounds of the suffering and dying, as he began to slowly ascend the pile of diseased humans that clawed pathetically at his armor. Bile sat in the back of his throat, and the air reeked of corruption, but still Archaon marched forwards. As he neared the apex of the pile, however, the Dark Templar felt his armor lightening as it rusted and began to crumble away. With each step, another piece of plate fell to the bodies below, covered in rot and decay. Still, the Lord of Chaos placed one foot in front of another as he felt the corruption enter his own body sweat pouring from his bare flesh as fever took hold. Pustules formed and burst all over his body, leaking stinky pus and blood that curdled like sludge. Black fluid leaked from his swollen eyes and ears, while bile dribbled from his mouth as decay embraced him. Archaon's feet swelled with fluid, and his guts expanded with horrid gases. His walk became little more than a gasping lurch, but still he would not yield to despair, even when his bones rotted away, leaving him barely able to crawl. As maggots and giant centipedes devoured his putrid flesh, the Dark Templar heard gurgling laughter, and then darkness consumed him. Awakening with a jolt, Archaon found his body and armor restored to normal as he rose to his feet. Looking around, he discovered that surrounding him on all sides was a twisting series of paths with the walls made of crystal. Within each pane, the Lord of Chaos could see a twisted reflection of himself from what could have been. Archaon the Demon Prince. Archaon the Chaos Spawn. Futures showing an Archaon who served one of the four powers above all others. There were other images too. Diederik Kastner, happily married and with children, living a fulfilled life. Diederik the Grand Master of the Order of the Twin-Tailed Orb. Diederik the Witch Hunter. Diederik the Grand Theogenist. Feeling the invitation of madness, Archaon roared his anger and tore a strip of cloth off his cape. He carefully tied it around his eyes and blinded himself to these endless visions and trusted simply in his instincts to guide the way. Calmed by the darkness that enveloped him, the Dark Templar walked with confidence until he felt the very air about him change. Removing the blindfold, Archaon found his senses suddenly under assault by the most wondrous assortment any man had ever witnessed. Before him lay a grand banquet amid an orgy offering to satisfy all desires that any creature had ever conceived. Women of unspeakable beauty, aromas to calm the most maddened of souls, and food so delicious that even a taste would render the feaster comatose. Anything Archaon could ever hope to hold was laid bare before him, 
and beckoned with sultry tones and soft flesh. Never again would he need to suffer. Never again would he be cold or lonely. He could indulge in the greatest of sins, partake in torture to elicit orgasmic screams, and be treated as a god for all eternity. Despite this gathering of temptation, Archeon felt nothing but the simmering rage that burned deep down within his soul. In each trial, he had witnessed countless faces of humans, whether they were meant to display despair, the potential of fate, or temptation. Yet all the Everchosen could see were puppets, agonized souls that were the playthings of powers far greater than themselves, forever forced to be the pawns in the gods' great game. Archaon would not be a piece on this board. He stoically marched past the Hall of Pleasure, his iron will unshaken once more. The path led to a dark chamber with countless skulls littering the ground. Flames leapt to life all along the walls, and a red tint filled the room as boiling blood bubbled up around the island of bones. The searing heat singed the hair from Archaon's body, and left him panting just as a monstrous form emerged from the walls of Hellfire. A mighty bloodthirster of corn stepped onto the narrow Isle of Skulls, roaring in challenge to the mortal who dared accept the Blood God's trial. Archaon rushed forwards, and the two champions exchanged a flurry of blows. The Slayer of Kings was sent spinning from the Dark Templar's grasp by a blow from the demon's brass axe, leaving Archaon with only his shield. Grunting with effort, he avoided blow after blow or parried them aside as he waited for an opportunity to counterattack. The Bloodthirster's strength was truly monstrous, which was only increased by the berserk rage possessing it as its axe came surging in. The blade crunched through the Warlord's shield and cleaved into Archaon's flesh, but rather than crumple in pain, he roared with effort and twisted his shield hard to rip the massive axe away from its wielder. Hurling the pair into the lake of boiling gore, the Lord of Chaos barely had time to brace as he was gored by the monster's curling horns. Impaled through his gut, Archaon landed a brutal blow on the Bloodthirster's ears before using his great strength to snap off the horn in his gut. The greater demon howled in rage, tearing at its broken horn where the Everchosen had been but a moment before. Sensing opportunity, the Dark Templar leapt for the demon's left hand and grabbed onto its barbed whip, ripping the weapon away. The Bloodthirster swung with claws extended and launched its foe across the Skull Isle. Bleeding from numerous wounds, Archaon climbed to his feet and spat out blood before uttering to the beast. Come on! Bat-like wings unfurled, and the greater demon sped towards the Everchosen with impossible speed to land the killing blow. But Archaon was ready. Deftly sidestepping the attack, he snapped the whip towards the Bloodthirster and grunted in satisfaction as it wrapped multiple times around the creature's neck. Heaving with all his strength, the Dark Knight felt the barbed coil go taut, and the monster suddenly snapped backwards and crashed onto the ground. Archaon leapt upon its back and pulled hard, ignoring the creature's struggles as its clawed hands tore at the demon whip. Barbs tore away chunks of flesh during the bloodthirster's thrashing, until after a few minutes the beast finally grew still. Suddenly, the fire snuffed out, and Archaon found himself standing in a simple shrine at the back of which was a throne carved from stone. Sitting within was a withered skeleton, the crown of domination resting atop its leering skull. Roaring in triumph, Archaon took the crown and held it up to the skies. His wounds knitting closed and his frame swelling with unholy power, it had taken over a century, but his dark quest was finally over. The Chaos Gods were united once more in their blessing of a single mortal man. To crown Archaon as ever chosen, they picked Belacor, and though the Demon Prince burned with jealousy, he was powerless to resist. The legions of Chaos who had followed their lord all this way knelt in reverence as the darkly angelic form of Belacor took the eye of Shirian 
and with a pulse of eldritch power fused it to the crown of domination once more. As the crown was lowered onto Archeon's head, a twin-tailed comet appeared in the heavens above. Placing on his helm and with dark flames flickering from his eyes, he turned to the sound of hordes of warriors chanting his name. Archeon drew forth the Slayer of Kings, mounted the Steed of the Apocalypse, and began his march to prepare for the final war. The end times had come. And with that, we have concluded the history of Archeon, so let's go ahead and move on to his equipment. One of Archeon's most important features is obviously that he is Everchosen, meaning that he is blessed by all four of the Dark Gods. This imbues him with the strengths of each mark that the gods grant to their greatest mortal followers. From the Mark of Corn, the Everchosen is granted a bottomless frenzy that grants him enough rage to wield his weapon with horrific skill and cut down his enemies with a flurry of blows. The Mark of Nurgle blesses him with a swarm of ever-present demon flies that fly into the enemy's orifices causing repulsive distractions. This causes Archeon's foes to swing wildly as they try to dislodge the horrid creatures and makes them notably less likely to strike him in melee. The Mark of Slanesh has gifted Archeon with experiences beyond that which any mortal can comprehend, so petty emotions like fear, terror, and panic have no effect on him. Finally, the Mark of Zinch grants the Everchosen with a natural capacity to manipulate magic, and the ability to subtly alter reality's course. When it's time to ride into battle, the weapon Archeon relies upon to reap the souls of his enemies is the infamous blade called the Slayer of Kings. It was Vangul, the second ever chosen, who trapped the greater demon of Korn named Uzul in this demon blade. Known as the Right Fist of Korn, Uzul was one of the mightiest bloodthirsters in existence before coming into his current humiliating form. Blessed with ceaseless rage and hatred, the Slayer of Kings is the mightiest demon blade ever forged, and can cut through all forms of armor as if it were air. Furthermore, should Archeon grow desperate, he can call upon the power of the demon bound within to grant him the strength and speed of Uzul. The only drawback is that the Bloodthirster's desire for blood will be uncontrollable for a time, so it will gladly strike allies or even Archeon himself to slake its thirst. When it comes to the most obvious of the Treasure of Chaos, that would be the suit of armor that covers Archeon's entire body. Forged by a demon long ago for the first ever chosen, Morkar the Uniter, the armor is practically invulnerable to all but the strongest of attacks. Extreme heat or cold mean nothing to this suit, and the Everchosen can walk through raging blizzards or moats of lava with ease. Few weapons can hope to wound the man inside, as the Hellforged Steel defies all attempts at harm. The only weapon in existence that was able to punch through its defenses with great success was the legendary Warhammer, Gaul Miraz. Another relic from the time of Morkar, the Crown of Domination is an ancient piece of Archeon's battle helm that exudes an unmatchable aura of raw malice. This enchanted crown cows the unruly servants of Chaos and forces them to bow down in subservience, including even the mindless monsters employed by such legions. This makes allies of Archeon incredibly unlikely to flee or disobey orders, as the crown's eldritch might presses down upon them and demands obedience. To those not in service to the Dark Powers, however, this aura can also be felt, eliciting terror in even the most stout-hearted of warriors. The most mystical piece of Archeon's treasures is the otherworldly Eye of Shirian that sits gleaming in the forehead of his helm. A shining beacon of power, it is this artifact that led to many calling Archeon the Three-Eyed King. Debatably the most powerful item in his possession, the eye allows Archeon to see visions of many possible realities just as they are about to occur, which allows him to predict the attacks of his enemies. Combined with the blessing from the Mark of Zinch, this makes the Lord of the End Times able to not only see what is coming, but manipulate it ever so slightly as well. Due to this, Archeon can be considered the greatest swordsman alive, as he can bob and weave through attacks that no other warrior could hope to avoid. 
This boosts his attacks as well, for what good is a parry or block when your foe already knows where it will be? Truly, he is a warrior without peer. Unlike the Eye which was discovered by the demon sorcerer Shirian, or the Slayer of Kings which is powered by the bloodthirster Uzul, the final treasure of chaos that Archeon possesses is just an actual demon. Contrary to appearance, Dorgar is not actually a horse or even a demon steed. He is an incredibly ancient and powerful demon whose main power lies in the ability to shapeshift. Though he is known as the Steed of the Apocalypse, this is most likely due to prophecy seeing him in the likeness that Dorgar would take when broken by Archeon, which is that of a warhorse. This is due to the beast taking a form that would match the Ever Chosen's assumption of the ideal mount, and the former Templar once rode the mighty steeds the Empire offered to knights of his order. However, it would be exceptionally dangerous to treat Dorgar as a mere beast, for he is far more deadly. Standing notably more broad and tall than any natural horse, the Steed of the Apocalypse is rippling with muscle and has spikes protruding all over. Razor fangs fill a mouth capable of tearing through armor and hellfire trails where the creature steps. With strength equal to trolls and easily as tough as a griffin, Dorgar makes a fitting mount for the Lord of the End Times. The truly unique power of the Steed of the Apocalypse, however, is that his legs take on a smoke-like property when running, which allows him to cross any form of terrain without so much as slowing. The typical dangers mounts face such as tripping on barricades, undergrowth, or other such environmental hazards have no effect against him. Swift and powerful, there is truly no hope of stopping Archaon upon his destined steed. The final thing of note that Archaon normally keeps close is his personal guard, who are known as the Swords of Chaos. Consisting of the greatest warriors the forces of Chaos have to offer, these knights are all chosen heavily blessed by the Dark Gods. Each one was once an independent champion before fate led them into a duel with the Ever Chosen, who defeated each of them in turn, but was impressed enough to spare their lives. Completely loyal to Archaon, they can always be found beside him the thickest fighting a battle has to offer. And with that, we have completed Archaon's equipment, so now we can move on to his skills section. Though he may look like a man, Archaon is better described as anything but. Like most Warlords of Chaos, the Ever Chosen has been heavily blessed by the Dark Gods, and he possesses a deceiving amount of strength. Already, Archaon has displayed his unholy strength on many occasions, though the greatest feat he has performed of late was to choke out that bloodthirster from his final trial with its own whip. Though he would go on to display greater power in the end times, we'll discuss that later. Of all the abilities Archaon has now, the only one he possessed before his descent into darkness was his skill in combat. Now having received powers that could be described as absurd, it is safe to say that only the absolute best warriors even stand a hope against him in combat. Already having been able to match blades with demons, elves, and worse before the completion of his ascension, even the greatest champions across the globe would struggle now thanks to the Eye of Shirian's augments. Tying into Archaon's disturbing level of skill, is the often unexpected ace that he keeps hidden within the Slayer of Kings. Although Archaon is already fast enough to be a blur and deflect blows from Greater Demons of Slaanesh despite his heavy armor, it is nothing compared to how lightning fast he becomes when Uzul is unleashed. With the power of a bloodthirster added to his own, Archaon is quite literally unstoppable once this final play has been made. Nothing has ever faced the full power of the Slayer of Kings, and even lasted for a moment. Of course, the formerly mentioned skills are all well and good, but if Archaon relied purely on offensive power, he would have died long ago. Between the armor of Morkar and the Eye of Shirian, any who strive to wound the Ever Chosen should save themselves the effort. It takes a monumental amount of strength or magic to penetrate the plate guarding Archaon's body, seeing as the only one to have truly done so was a man at his absolute peak who went on to claim godhood, wielding one of the most powerful dwarven hammers ever forged. 
That's, of course, assuming the attack can even hit the Warlord, as the Ever Chosen most often sees the swing coming for him and dodges. A strike needs to be insanely fast, unexpected, or just plain damn lucky to land. Furthermore, the final Ever Chosen is strong in more than just a physical sense as well. Thanks to the mark of Zinch and the Eye of Shirian, Archeon can see the billowing winds of magic and control them with pretty alarming skill. For someone not born attuned to magic and receiving no tutelage on the subject, he's an absolute terror capable of defending himself from enemy wizards and unleashing bolts of eldritch might to incinerate regiments of foes or buff his own troops. That, of course, leads to the final skill of Archeon, which is without a doubt his most important. The Ever Chosen has a truly unbreakable will, refusing to give himself to any single Chaos God and remaining solely dedicated to his goal of destroying this world. This willpower also translates to his incredible success as a Warlord of Chaos, for he doesn't tolerate the petty squabbles between those who serve him. It takes a truly unique individual to force all four of the ruinous powers under one banner, which alone should be a sign of leadership and single-mindedness capable of forging the wild abandon of chaos into a single force capable of shattering planets. This is only made worse by the former Knight of the Empire having a good mind for strategy and tactics, normally well beyond the grasp of Chaos Lords. Without a doubt, this world is doomed. For the famous battle segment, we'll be looking at the Battle of Brilloin Castle. The legions of Archeon laid siege to Brilloin Castle, though this proved to be far more dangerous for the warriors of Chaos than the Bretonians. Peasant-operated trebuchets opened fire. The first piece of masonry dashed the brains of the Chaos Giant known as Corpse Maker over a 20-yard area. The Ever Chosen's forces continued to take horrendous casualties, as stone after stone plowed holes through his infantry. Mildly annoyed, Archeon raised the Slayer of Kings, bellowing a challenge to the Lord of the Castle and calling him a coward. Baron Lucas, the arrogant warden of Brillon Castle, took the challenge as a personal insult to his honor. Seeing that the Chaos Host was already badly damaged, he ordered for all of his knights to gather at the gates. With a blaring of horns, the gates were opened, allowing several hundred knights to ride out with lances lowered towards their foes. High above flew glorious Pegasus Knights, led by the Baron himself upon his regal hippogriff. Now that the Bretonians were committed to the attack, Archaon grinned and signaled for his reserve forces to come forward. From behind a hidden ridge rode close to a thousand Chaos Knights, the ground trembling at their passing. Among their number were far worse things, snorting metal machines that roared from fiery throats in anticipation of the coming slaughter. The brass behemoths barged their way to the front of the charge, the skull-helmed riders atop them crying out exultation to the blood god. The two armies met in a titanic clash of steel and muscle, lances on both sides punching through armor and explosions of gore. The knights of Bretonia fought with great valor and courage, but they proved unable to thwart the unyielding might of the skull crushers of Korn. Axes slashed through breastplates and helms as the juggernaut cavalry carved a path of bloody ruin through their foes. The Pegasus Knights dove hard to intercept the stampeding juggernauts, but Village unleashed bolts of sorcery that engulfed the winged steeds in magical flames of change. In an instant, the Pegasi were transformed into dozens of different forms, though none of which could fly. Mount and Rider both could only scream as they plummeted to their deaths. Seeking to rally his men, Baron Lucas dived into the Chaos Knights atop his mighty hippogriff, the pair tearing utter ruin through the Warriors of Chaos. He lanced straight for Archaon, but the Lord of Chaos simply sat upon his steed unconcerned, as his warriors parted to allow in a gift to this arrogant lord. A hulking slaughter brute lumbered towards the Bretonians, casually swatting aside the occasional brave knight who attempted to lance it. Lucas's hippogriff leapt at the monster, and though the Baron's sword was aimed true, he struck nothing but air. 
The creature was shackled to the will of Archeon's most skilled exalted hero, who even now manipulated the beast's movements using a wooden puppet. Lucas's blade was parried aside again and again, as if the monster before him had spent a lifetime learning how to be a master fencer. Realizing that he was outmatched, the brave Baron shouted one final challenge as his mount dived in. Bored of this challenge, the exalted hero exerted his full control, and in the blink of an eye the slaughter brute grasped hold of the hippogriff and tore its wings off, showering blood and feathers everywhere before smashing the beast into a pulp with repeated blows from its massive fists. The slaughter brute then picked up Lucas in one giant claw and crushed him like an egg. It was too much for the Bretonians, and they fled, Archaon's forces cutting them down. So did another fall victim to the Ever Chosen's dark quest. And that concludes the famous battle section. So now we are on to the more casual part of the video. And for those of you maybe wondering why the famous battle section wasn't that long, that battle itself wasn't very long, and of course we covered pretty in detail the battle for the Altar of Ultimate Darkness, so I'm giving it kind of like a 1.5. In any event, uh, this is where we go through the end times. I always do these sections much more liberally slash casually, just due to the way the end times is kind of a mess and it allows me to basically run you through it really fast because otherwise we would be here for a very, very, very long time. So with Archeon, let's go ahead and go through what all he did that was really important during the end times and kind of where he was for most of it. Uh, contrary to popular belief, Archeon, um, if it's popular belief, I suppose, but Archeon wasn't super involved in the end times. He actually didn't really do anything until the fourth book though um so that's why it may seem a little shorter than you would expect but let's go ahead and go through it so the end times basically starts a little bit um after archaon gets the full set of the ever chosen so he gets the crown of domination gets crowned ever chosen and he rides up north back to the realm of chaos in the end times and he goes to the inevitable city and what the inevitable city is is in the realm of chaos there's kind of different parts of the Realm of Chaos that are split up and designated to each god. And in the Xenchian part, there's this huge, indescribable city of just endless madness and craziness, and it's called the Inevitable City. Um, this, also, this tends to kind of be due to, if you go to the Realm of Chaos, you're kind of going to wind up there eventually. Um, the mad are usually drawn there. And it's one of the few actual legit cities that the Demons of Chaos have. Um, and obviously they share it with the Warriors of Chaos. But it's firmly in Zinch's domain. But it's kind of like the apex of the Realm of Chaos. So like when Warhammer Online Age of Reckoning was a thing, the Chaos Capital or the Destruction Capital was the inevitable city. In any event, Archaon basically goes there and gathers up a huge, 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 huge horde. Uh, the Twin-Tailed Comet is in the sky, and it appeared, of course, when Archaon was crowned, and it signals that something really big is about to happen. So Archaon basically has decided that it's time to end the world, and he sets his master plan into motion. But his master plan is not what Chaos, the gods included, and the greater demons, and everyone expected. Archaon actually goes up to the inevitable city and just kind of sits there for, like, years. Um, this kind of causes chaos to st start going stir crazy because everyone is basically all the demons, all the warriors of chaos, beastmen, um, all sorts of creatures and monsters are gathering essentially to Archaon's banner at the inevitable city and then they're just sitting around. So a lot of them start fighting each other, many of them basically break off and go south on their own and start kind of attacking by themselves. Um, there were a few legions that we'll kind of describe in their own videos. Sigvald's video has one of them where each of the gods kind of picked a mortal champion who basically went and led their own invasion. Um, Sigvald uh, being the one we have up right now. The others would include Village, um, led Zinch's forces, and then I believe Valkia led Korn. And I don't remember who led Nurgle's, but Nurgle plays a bigger part than the other three. So when Archaon's sitting up in the inevitable city, he's purposefully letting this happen. He wants Chaos to get stir-crazy. And his rational 
rationale is that he kind of wants chaos to reach its apex before he unleashes it entirely so he decides to sit and let all of chaos fight itself to kill all the weak people get all the weak people and the backstabbers and all those schemers that he can just get them all killed anyone who can't survive just sitting around isn't good enough to be in his army and he also <clears throat> he doesn't order anyone to go south on their own but he doesn't stop them because he basically just views it as his vanguard and basically people who are just going to go mess things up there are a couple people who are of note that go south um the most important of which is vardek krom who kind of is uh you can think of him as archaon's herald in a sense he basically rides south and joins up with the forces that go down there and they just devastate kislev like kislev just gets completely annihilated um doesn't even like have much of a chance to put up a fight so that's when the Empire wrecks the barrier, and the barrier basically stops Chaos dead. But of course the barrier is drawn at the Empire's northern border, so there's no way for the Kislevites to get across, um, those that survived. And basically they're just in small pockets trying to fight while Archaon is sitting up, waiting. So after a while, Archaon goes, rides out, and he goes to find the Glotkin. And if you don't know who the Glotkin are, they're these three brothers who one of them is basically a great unclean one even though he's not a demon um but he's basically he, he's the size of a greater demon because he's so horribly mutated and then he has a brother on one shoulder and a brother on the other shoulder one of whom is basically you can think of him as kind of just a generic chaos lord with a scythe that's nurgle themed and the other one is a basically chaos sorcerer lord of nurgle so it's this trio of nurgle which you know nurgle's magic number is three and Ar they are basically out fighting and doing a bunch of random stuff and Arcan goes to find them and he basically tells them to stop screwing around and come join him. So the brothers Glot come with him to the inevitable city. Um, actually no, I don't think they come with him but he meets them out somewhere. And he gives them an urn. And he also gave an urn to Gutrot Spume who basically led a naval invasion of... Um, the northern empire he gave one to the glotkin and they attacked through marienburg and then came towards altdorf and then he gave one to these um he gave one to these three i forget what their names are but they're these three guys who they're called the magath lords um and they basically ride these giant troll like monsters called magoths and um kind of like a shagath but magoth and they're these really ugly nurgle-like creatures and their job is they basically kind of slip they came with gutrot spume um across the sea of claws because gutrot spume is he's called the i think he's called the kraken lord or something like that but i don't remember what his exact title is but he half of his body is basically just tentacles and like a big mouth and he uh has a tentacle themed ship and he's, he's really into tentacles um, for Nurgle. And he sails his big fleet across the ocean. He attacks and heads towards Altdorf going through the forest so he can pick up a bunch of beastmen on the way. The three Magath lords go to the Brass Keep where there's a ton of Warriors of Chaos who it turns out end up being Nurgle themed. Um, that's where he finds the... Um, oh goodness, I forget. The Blight Lords. Um, which are just super mutated really powerful warriors of chaos they are also like much bigger than most warriors of chaos like they're ogre sized so the three so archaon sends them all to go weaken the empire and he gives them the explicit goal of destroying altdorf and killing karl franz that's their job so they go down there they do a bunch of stuff and archaon basically sits back and waits and word gets back to him eventually that the brothers failed he was kind of expecting this so Archaon decides, okay, now that Nurgle has softened them up and my legions are just making a mess out of everything and the wall, the, the great wall essentially has completely collapsed and fallen, now it's time for me to make my move. So Archaon gathers up his entire army and he marches south. By the time he gets to the Empire, most of the Empire's defenders have rallied to either one of two places. Either they've gone to Middenheim under Valton, who... It is a really long story, but it's kind of like the ancestral enemy of Archaon from when Archaon was invented. And then the rest of them went to Averheim with Karl Franz. So most people went to Averheim. 
So in Min in Mindenheim, there was basically a really really big army that had a couple of small groups of allies, like you know, very small amount of dwarves, and they would have put up a really good fight against Archeon's essentially endless hordes. But if you're familiar with the end times, something um, that I'll reveal in a later video when I talk about him, someone steals the flame of Ulrich from underneath Mindenheim. And its defenses against demons is basically completely lost. Like everyone gathered there under the assumption that the Ulrich, the flame of Ulrich would keep out the demons, which it would have, but somebody stole it kind of for their own selfish means. Uh, another one of the good guys stole it. And so there was no defense against demons. So Archaon was basically just able to completely unleash his army. And his tactic for attacking Middenheim was he unleashed... The Warriors of Chaos and the Demons of Chaos, um, basically at the walls. Um, he sent beastmen through the walls, and then he actually forged an alliance with the Skaven. Um, and had them attack up through the Ulrichsberg, which is this, you know, giant rock that Mindenheim sits on. It's like a mountain almost, but it's got a bunch of crazy tunnels and, um, a maze basically buried under it. And so Archeon sent the Skaven to attack from beneath and behind, while he attacked from the front. So Cairo's Fate Weaver joined him and was basically his main magic guy. He also had Malagor the Dark Omen with him, um, though Malagor and Kairos both get swatted by the same guy. Um, they both get just obliterated. So Archeon though proved to be exceptionally scary in that fight. Uh, Middenheim had this giant gate that the Warriors of Chaos for the life of them could not get through. Like, they were throwing monsters at it, they were throwing demons at it, they were throwing everything at it, and that gate just was not budging. And the forces of Bindheim were doing a pretty good job defending it, all things considered. Well, Archeon literally walks up to it, draws the Slayer of Kings, buffs it with magic, and then just smacks the gate, and it just explodes. Like, the entire gate just instantly shatters, because Archeon is so ludicrously strong in the end times. So Archaon rides into the city, and he is there expressly for the purpose of killing Valton. He thinks it's Karl Franz at first, but it's not. It's Valton who... Valton um, was originally invented hand-in-hand -hand with Archaon, and when Archaon was supposed to be the incarnation of Chaos, essentially, Valton was the incarnation of Order, or Sigmar. So Valton has Galmaraz, because Karl Franz gave it to him. And he um, is leading the defense, and he's really powerful. You know, Wolfric the Wanderer attacks him, uh, Harry the Hammer attacks him, a bunch of these really famous Chaos guys attack him, and he completely just destroys all of them. Like, it's not even close. And so Valtin basically waits at the very, very top of the um, city of Mindenheim with all the final defenders, and they have this big final stand against Archaon. And at this point, there's kind of two versions of what happens, based on if you read the mini novels or the actual, like, large books. In the large books, what happens is that Archeon gets into a fight with Valtin. This happens in both novels, but in... I guess it's easier to describe the mini novel first. In the mini novel, Archeon fights a couple of people before he gets to Valtin. For instance, he fights Brunner the Bounty Hunter, if you're familiar with him. Uh, and Bruner basically, like, shoots him with some really... I think he shoots him with Warpstone or something just really powerful that actually dents Archeon's armor and gets his attention. So Bruner dies. Um, and basically everyone... A bunch of heroes from old white, like, white dwarf stories or black library books that were there attack Archeon, and he basically just butchers all of them. He takes a little bit of damage, but not much. Then he goes to fight Vulton, and it's a really close fight. Archaon fights Volton. Volton busts up his armor pretty bad. I think he breaks his shield. Um, but inevitably, Archaon starts to get the upper hand. And as Archaon slowly beats down Volton, he goes in for the killing blow. But before he can land it, Volton gets decapitated by this um, blade, thrown blade that a, a um, Vermin Lord Deceiver threw from behind him. So basically, this Vermin Lord, which are greater demons of the Skaven, um, for all intents and purposes, and this is kind of the Clan Eshin-themed one, he basically throws this oversized ninja star and just completely decapitates Valton, stealing Archaon's glory, and just because, you know, Skaven. And Archaon gets pissed. So he kind of gets so angry that he just kind of starts lashing out at everybody. 
Um, and this allows a good amount of the people at the last stand of Middenheim to kind of do a, a, a sortie and they fight their way out and they basically are able to escape Middenheim because Archaon is so angry at the Skaven at that point it just turns into a mess. Um, so after this fight, um, the Skaven officially ally themselves with Archaon even though Archaon is super angry. But Thankwell and... Uh, Screech Vermin King who is the most powerful of the Vermin Lords and Thankful is of course very prominent because this happens in Thankful's book um, basically come to Archeon on behalf of the Council of Thirteen and officially broker a deal with him um, Archeon at this point he doesn't like the Skaven but he does view them as children of chaos so he accepts them into his legion and this is where he basically has his legion at full power so he has the Beastmen of Chaos, the Demons of Chaos, the Chaos Dwarves, the Skaven, the Warriors of Chaos, all united under one banner, and they are ridiculously strong. So Valtin dies, uh, Archaon is pretty angry about it, but he kind of just deals with it. He takes Gaul Moraz as his trophy, and basically keeps it on his throne. And so what he does after that point is Village the Cursling at, around this time shows up, and Archeon basically tells him to go to Averheim and destroy it. Because everyone who's tried to attack Averheim has gotten the crap beat out of them. Because there's a bunch of dwarves and a bunch of humans there. So Archeon goes south eventually because he's not, getting, he's not hearing good things. And when he shows up, he shows up about just in time to see Karl Franz launch a... Um, basically a... Um, I don't want to call it sallying out because they did some kind of magic bullshittery to pull it off. But Karl Franz leads a small force out and just completely wrecks Village's camp. And Village himself is defeated and goes away. Um, he doesn't die, but he essentially dies, for all you need to know. And Archaon leads the invasion himself. But at this point, Archaon has kind of partnered up a little more heavily with Korn's Legion. So he, he sent in Nurgle a while ago, uh, and Nurgle just... To Altdorf, and Nurgle got the shit kicked out of him. Like, he did really well, but he ends up losing. Then he sends uh, Zinch to take Averheim. Zinch screws up and fails, and now Archeon's getting super angry about all this. So, Archeon leads the invasion of Averheim, and his express goal is to kill Karl Franz. That's the only thing he wants to pull off. So, he attacks the city, and it's a huge, sprawling fight. It's just completely ridiculous. And he. Uh, fights uh, he doesn't join the fighting until later uh, a bunch of people on both sides die a bunch of named characters and when Archaon finally shows up he starts dueling Karl Franz and Franz is this you know he's the incarnate of heavens at this point so he's not wielding Galmaraz but he's basically wielding celestial magic in the shape of Galmaraz and he fights Archaon around for a bit and then Archaon um, to show that he is superior and that Karl Franz's god is fake, you know, to show Sigmar isn't real, doesn't exist, and it's just a, you know, and Karl Franz is being used as a puppet, like all people are by the gods. Uh, Archaon uses his magic and the Eye of Shirian to literally rip the wind of heaven out of Karl Franz and just, like, blast it back into space. And, like, just completely make Karl Franz a mortal man again. And he's just, he's got nothing special to him anymore. So Karl Franz is in a really bad spot at that point and manages to fall back thanks to sh some shenanigans by Balthazar Gelt. And Archaon is already getting worried that he's being denied a second time, so he attacks he starts attacking the celestial or this uh, gold magic um, dome that Balthazar Gelt summoned and Archaon is wailing on it. So Balthazar Gelt at this point pulls off his master spell where he transmutes a bunch of people into gold and teleports them out of the city. But he purposefully leaves behind a few people who chose to say, like, Ungrim Iron Fist. And if you watch my Ungrim video, you know what happens next. But Archaon and Ungrim have this huge titanic duel, because Ar uh, Ungrim by this point is the incarnate of fire, so he's not a pushover by any means, even compared to his normal self. And the two have this just completely insane duel. Um, mo almost the entire thing's off screen, very unfortunately, because it probably would have provided some awesome artwork, but Games Workshop didn't give it to us. And so the two of them clash, 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 while all of the Order forces are running away. And eventually, Ungrim just can't kill Archaon. 
Like, he can hold him off, essentially, but he, he just doesn't have the ability to kill him. Uh, or even wound him, really. So, they fight for a while, and finally, Ungrim gets killed by Archeon, and in a final fuck you, basically, he completely unleashes all of his vengeance in the form of the Wind of Fire, and it just nukes Aberheim. Like, it just incinerates everybody in the city, with the exception, pretty much, of Archeon, and maybe some of the Swords of Chaos. But Archeon's army gets completely demolished by this, and so he's forced to retreat. So Archeon goes back up to Middenheim, and it's at this point that the End Times goes from being kind of weird and not doing a great job of keeping up with itself to just being completely bonkers. So at this point, which normally I don't talk about this part of the story unless it's one of the big eight being the Incarnates, but Archeon is of course involved in this. So Archeon basically finds, it's, it's not explained how he knew it was there or how it even got there, but basically buried beneath Middenheim is a relic of the Old Ones. And by Archeon finds it and orders all of his sorcerers to perform this really ornate giant ritual crap that turns it from whatever its original intent was to instead being making it so that it, if activated it will implode and instantly and create another entrance to the realm of chaos. And by doing so, this would destabilize the entire planet and basically the realm of chaos would just eat everything almost instantly. So, Archeon sets about doing this, um, and he's feeling pretty confident at this point. You know, he's killed Valtin, he has Galmaraz, he's ripped the winds of heaven out of Karl Franz, and ultimately it's important to remember that the original version of Ar the original intent of Archeon was to kill everything, and to make sure there are no gods, there are no mortals, there's nothing. And a really big part of his personal motivation is proving that the gods are capricious, false, and with the exception of like the chaos gods just don't exist like they're just fabrications that men use to explain magic and some other crap but all the gods are just manipulations so he hates sigmar and anything that represents sigmar and that's his entire motivation for everything that he's done up until this point so um the good guys uh, have gotten away from him though and he's still kind of bothered that franz is alive because that to him personally that means his victory isn't complete so Cairo's fate weaver comes to him to basically see what he's doing uh, because Cairo's fate weaver is not too keen on the whole blow up the entire planet idea um, but Archeon kills him which is pretty impressive because killing Kairos is not easy um, but Archeon uh, butchers him and basically uh, kicks his corpse into this giant hole of blood on the floor and sacrifices Kairos Fate Weaver, who's the most powerful of the greater demons of Zinch, to Korn, and asks that Korn give him someone who can basically get the job done. So Korn sends his this really powerful bloodthirster named Kabanda. And Kabanda is um, one of the most powerful bloodthirsters, apparently. Um, he did not exist in Warhammer Fantasy until this point, but he does exist for he has existed for a very long time in Warhammer 40k. So this kind of tied into this weird spiel about kind of giving back the hints and ideas that the 40k universe is connected to the fantasy universe, which prior to the end times was not a thing anymore. So a lot of people, myself included, found that really weird. But anyways, Kabanda shows up and he's at the head of this um, faction, you can call them, called the Blood Hunt. And this is just this massive horde of corn followers. Um, and Archeon basically goes from being Chaos Undivided to just kind of Korn, um, which is another weird part of the story, but he does it anyway. So Korn leads this massive invasion of Athel Lorin, which is where all the heroes are hiding, and they get into this big fight, and Korn basically devastates Athel Lorin. And so Teclas pulls some bullshit and teleports everybody to Mindheim in kind of just a complete Hail Mary pass to stop Archeon. So, we're almost to the end. Um, Archeon, Teclis, unfortunately, teleported everyone to kind of a part of Mindheim, but teleported himself literally right into Archeon's throne room, like right in front of him. So Archeon um, kind of finds it funny, if anything, and imprisons Teclis instead of just killing him, and takes away his stuff. And at this point, his 
doomsday device, you could call it, is pretty much ready to go. So Archaon summons all of his greatest champions who are still alive. You know, Sigvald, Throg, um, a bunch of random people who existed in White Dwarf magazines and stuff like that. And basically sends them all out to go um, kill everybody. Um, he And this is also after Setra has come to him and some other stuff. And Manfred and Archaon allowed them onto his side. He didn't really give them any orders. He just kind of like ignored them but allowed them to be there. So they also go out and fight. And as everybody goes out fighting, Archaon is being pretty smug at this point. And goes ahead and goes down to the Doomsday Device just to make sure nobody messes with it. Um, so if you've watched the Carl Franz video, it's around this point, a little after this point, that he gets his hammer back, and when Carl Franz gets back his hammer, he is obviously revealed as Sigmar. Like, he's just Sigmar. He's not, he's not like an incarnation of him, he is literally just Sigmar the God, um, wearing Carl Franz's body. So he leads all the forces of order down into the depths to well not the forces of order but the forces of not chaos i should say uh down into the depths to fight archaon so it's all of the incarnates except for the incarnate of fire who's dead at this point versus archaon the swords of chaos and then each of the chaos gods sends in like a demon legion so this huge brawl erupts in this underground cavern and the first person to fight archaon is grimgore Grimgore basically joined sides with the Order factions and Nagash under the complete pretense that all of them said he was a better fighter, but Archaon was mouthing off. So Grimgore and Archaon have this huge fight with the Swords of Chaos squaring up against the uh, Mortals, and it's pretty evenly matched. Um, they have this ridiculously huge fight, and Archaon is trying really hard to kill Grimgore, but Grimgore is just tough as nails. And he's kind of just the meanest orc that's ever been. And Archaon just can't for the life of him pin this guy down. So they fight, they fight, they fight. And finally, Grimgore gets a little uh, savvy. And basically, when Archaon's trying to just, you know, parry and worry about his axe, Skitsnick, Grimgore goes in for a headbutt and hits Archaon in the head so hard that it completely shatters the Eye of Shirian. And the Eye of Shirian is easily the most important tool in Archaon's set. Like, it's the most powerful artifact of Chaos because it made his magic insanely strong, gave him the ability to basically predict the future, and all of this other stuff. So Grimgore smashes Archaon's, indents Archaon's helm, which destroys the Eye of Shirian, um, because what, what a hell of a headbutt. And Archaon gets so angry that he just immediately unleashes Uzul, um, the uh, demon bloodthirster inside of the Slayer of Kings, and his speed and strength double, and at least double, and it catches Grimgore completely off guard. He just immediately kills Grimgore, like just immediately just puts him down. So Grimgore dies, and the so the Incarnate of Beasts is now dead, and then he goes to fight Sigmar. Um, and Sigmar is riding on Deathclaw, Carl Franz's griffin, and the two of them get into the most epic of epic duels. And basically what happens in the end is Deathclaw gets mortally wounded while fighting, and then Sigmar basically falls on the ground and Archaon goes in for a killing blow, and Sigmar just immediately winds up and just smacks Dorgar right in the face with Galmaraz and just kills it. So Dorgar goes down hard, just snap neck, pulverized to ash, just dead. So now it's just Archaon versus Sigmar, and now two of the artifacts of Chaos have been destroyed. So they duel, and they continue dueling, and Archaon, with the power of Uzul, gets the upper hand and disarms Sigmar, and Galmaraz basically gets hurled off this cliff into oblivion. So at this point, Archaon basically announces that he wins and he he knows at this point that it's sigmar standing before him because teclas taunts him that sigmar is not only real but is basically coming to kick his ass and archaon basically screams at sigmar i'm stronger than you. you i always knew you were false i always knew you were fake you're just a man you're nothing more you're not a god and he brings down the slayer of kings you know two hands uh to kill him 
And Sigmar, uh, because he's Heavens Incarnate, basically summons up this bolt of lightning and just stops the Slayer of Kings. Just instantly stops it. And then probably the most interesting part of the End Times happens, for well, at least for that book, which is that Sigmar actually quotes the end of Necrodomo the Insane's uh, prophecy um, from the Liber Caliesta, if you remember the beginning of this video. Um, which Archeon either never read that part or didn't... I'm, I'm not sure how if... Because Sigmar is clearly uh, speaking in prophecy, but for some reason Archeon was not aware or just ignored this part where Sigmar basically knows he's going to win this fight. Like, he summons lightning and just shatters the Slayer of Kings. It just completely just explodes into a billion little shards. And Azula set free. And Archeon goes flying back. And he basically is almost foaming at the mouth, yelling at Sigmar. And the revelation that Sigmar gives to Archeon is probably the most important part of Archeon's story. Which is that Sigmar reveals that Archeon was born and was intended by fate to be the man who would destroy chaos. He was he was meant to be the greatest warrior the empire would ever make and he was supposed to basically become you know uh grand theogenes if not emperor and basically he was destined to lead man into a new age and to personally be the one who once and for all would figure out how to destroy the dark powers. But he gets corrupted by this prophecy, and he was so obsessed with the idea that Sigmar had to be there and had to help him, instead of just standing on his own two feet and choosing his destiny, that he basically just completely got tricked and used, and basically turned into everything he didn't want to be, because he was so obsessed and so easily played by the Chaos Gods and just didn't see through their designs. Um, they used him. They completely used him. And Sigmar basically just pitied him. Like, Sigmar couldn't reach him because there were some outstanding circumstances that involved Zinch that basically cut Sigmar off from Archeon. And then after that, Archeon just denied him. And Sigmar couldn't get him back. So Archeon was played like a fool for his entire journey. And this basically just makes him lose it. And he charges at Sigmar and Sigmar summons a bolt of lightning and just blasts him in the chest. And Archeon goes flying off this cliff into oblivion. At least so it appears. So after that, some other stuff happens that I've gone over in other character stories. And um, basically the Doomsday device goes off, the Realm to Chaos portal starts to open and all of the incarnates team up to close it and if they can close it they save the day and if they can't the world is doomed so of course if some shenanigans happen if you watch some of my other videos where they fail and Archeon after a few of the other incarnates either are disabled or are killed um, Archeon comes up right at the end when Sigmar is trying to rally the incarnates and tackles him because Archeon did not fall to his death, he actually caught the cliff and climbed back up. And he tackles Sigmar into the abyss. And the two of them are basically wrestling as they're just falling for etern into wherever this place goes. And at this point, the Realm of Chaos just explodes entirely and sucks everybody up. With the exception of Sigmar, which of course leads into the Age of Sigmar. Um, so, that's Archeon in the End Times. I, I know that's long-winded, but, um, of course, um, oh, I forgot to tell people to skip. Well, whatever, I'll have, um, timestamps down below, so hopefully if people don't like the End Times part, they'll just skip it. So, with that, now we can move on to the final segment. Alright, and finally, last but not least, as I lean back in my comfy chair, we can do the closing remarks for the video, um, including Archeon and Total War. So, because this video is already two hours long, um, no thanks to the end times portion, of course, um, I'm just going to get straight to the point and say Archeon is pretty well interpreted in Total War. Uh, I like I like most of the things about them, and considering the restrictions they had of their only, of course, being about five or six races in it release, they did the best they could with his quest lines. I wish they were a little bit more true to the actual storylines, or at least opponents he faced, to get the various 
pieces of his equipment other than because I think right now like 90% of them you just fight chaos over and over again but it is what it is um, Archeon I think is pretty well developed my only complaint about him currently is that he does not have they, they interpreted the mark of Zinch because you know he's got his he's got his uh, lore of fire then you've got your mark of corn now if you play multiplayer at least uh, which the video I'm going to be putting out tomorrow if you're a patron and if you're anybody else you've already seen my video on Mortal Empires but um, I'd really like to see them give him his mark of Nurgle with the swarm of flies ability I don't think it should be quite as potent as the one you see on the demon spew or the zombie dragons which I think is like a 30 meter radius but maybe like a 20 meter radius would be nice but in any event, uh, I think of most of the characters, I mean, there's very few characters who are not well interpreted within Total War, and Archeon is definitely one who is. So, you know, he sounds good, he looks good, he feels good. <laughs> what are you going to add? Uh, the only problem is he kind of has a graphical glitch, I, I, at least I think it's a glitch, where his head is like shiny as shit, <laughs> like it glows. So, um, yeah, that's all I'm going to say for Archeon. Uh, his campaign, at least in the foundation patch for Total War Warhammer 1, which came out with Norska, is fantastic. He has a great skill tree, and he's super awesome, so I can't wait for that update to Mortal Empire so that I can play him again, because I really like Archeon's campaign. So, without further ado, oh, that is the longest lore video I've ever made, I think. And it was horrible. <laughs> but I don't have to do it again. I think the only ones that are going to be worse than this are probably like Nagash and Sigmar. So in any event, um, thank you all so much for watching. Um, I appreciate your support. I appreciate you showing up. I really appreciate everyone who's helped me get to 10,000 subs. What the fuck, man? <laughs> like, I guess this video is kind of going to be the 10,000 sub thing, but we'll talk about that more another time. So, um, thank you all so much for watching. Stick around. Keep an eye out on things. I've got tons more shit coming. I just, I wanted to get this out before I did anything else. Because I just, I couldn't, I couldn't justify putting out a non-lore video, like, on a regular basis. And then, you know, when everyone's been waiting, what, five months? So, here's Archeon. It's done. It's finished. I'm happy with it. I was going to record more in-game footage, but a lot of people and a lot of patrons were saying, just put images, we're just here to listen, so hopefully they're right. <laughs> I do also want to take a quick second to say, those of you who may be familiar with the Archeon series, like maybe you've read the actual novels, you may notice that this story on this video is different than yours. Um, some of it may be completely different, some of it may be partially different. And that's because one thing that I should, probably should have said at the beginning of the video, but I'm saying it now, is that the way I determine canonicity is that I usually go army book, and then personal books, and then, well, army book, other army books, and then personal books. Um, and the Archeon personal books are wildly different than every other source. Um, the Archeon personal books, he only has a single eye, because one of his eyes has like a giant chunk of warp stone shoved in it. He also... Uh, the Swords of Chaos are also a like group of angelic, weird Chaos Warrior mutant things, and it's their origin is never explained. And eventually, I think they all die except for one, maybe. But you know, the actual Swords of Chaos kind of are honorary versions instead of the real deal. In that one, he also basically can't die because every time he does, Bellicor just resurrects him back to life and changes destiny and fate. And it's it's just a really goofy story. Uh, it's it's certainly not a bad series of books, but I don't consider that to be the canon version of Archeon because it's so wildly weird and different and inaccurate to the Archeon in the army books and the Archeon in Total War Warhammer because obviously both of them have both their eyes and a number of other uh, myriad details. So this is the version, this is the best version I can tell of the story which basically tells the army book version supplemented with all the other versions so you tell the core version of the story but then if for instance like his childhood which is covered in his personal novels but is not covered in anything else that's where you would supplement that in so that is like how I like to do my lore videos I consider that the most accurate way to do them because it gives the most cohesive story and I think I do a good job of taking 
bits and pieces to help tell the story of the core of the character. So hopefully you like that. Uh, if you want, you can of course check out Archeon's personal novels from Games Workshop. They're a very fun, uh, there's two of them, very fun series. Um, technically, Lord of Chaos, which I think, or Lord of the End Times, which came out with the End Times, is technically the third novel to the series, but that Archeon is completely different than the one in the first two, so read it at your own risk. Um, I hope you all enjoyed. I'm going to go get some rest and work on some other stuff that's going to be coming out soon, so I hope you all have a great day. See you around. Bye.